And I'm just going to do a quick intro. My name is Yvette. I'm the Visitor Experience Coordinator here at the museum. With me on our team is Jasmine, um, Valerie, and Melissa just helping us out, as well as Rebecca Hoffberger. So she's going to start us off giving our intro, but we're super excited to have the artist Lonnie Holly here, as well as producer um, George King. And so Rebecca, please take it away. Well, I have a lot of thank yous first to our staff for making this happen. Secondly, to a person I consider a wise man, a wisdom that was a uh, hard won. And that is more than just an artist, a performer, a singer, a composer, a father, Lani Holly. Uh, Lani, I have to know whether we have been correctly uh, quoting you for years. I heard that some little kid asked you what was art and you said these words and tell me if, if it's not right because you know how people say things and quote them wrong but i thought that you said just let it leak from your eyes and your heart and your soul and your hands and then it is art does that sound like something you would have said uh, that's uh the truth about art and also we got to find that art is a self-rendering process. Our art is, to me, all rendered true internal self because it has to come from the self. And if the self is representing the soul, then what we do is a representation of ourselves while we lived it. And then if we have seen some someone say a picture is worth a thousand words. Now we are getting thousands and thousands, maybe even millions of pictures so quickly. How do we add all of those pictures up and say that they gonna equal out to worry? I call it thought smithing. Our brains are now having to uh, take in all this thought, all of these images, and we just have to work with them. And as artists, are, I, I think if the, the students or the humans just see what my capabilities have and is presenting as an artist, uh, how that brain is, is very important into the arts and it's very important for us to appreciate just being the art. I don't want to over talk everybody else, but we need to learn how to appreciate being the artist because art, art is one of the highest status that were upon the planet at one time. It was not no like, you know, uh, you had this and you had that. Art was the the creativity foundation. You understand what I'm saying? Creativity come, but it needs a foundation and art were that. So I, I really uh, thank you for all of those words and understanding. And I wanted to thank above all, because this is something very few filmmakers would spend so much of your own life, Mr. King to um, faithfully portray uh, an artist and you know filmmaking and you're also a photographer and quite a wonderful one is an artist in their own right but that you won the trust of Lonnie to be able to open his life his personal life as well as his artistic life and how great that you have given the world but also Lonnie such a gift to capture so many years of his life and his works and his thoughts and his living uh, for forever, you know? Um, I, I wanted to say something because, you know, being the founder and director at the Visionary Museum, we're aware of so many artists from all over the world. And I was fascinated, uh, uh, Mr. Holly, when I found out that you had that near death experience as a small child, when you were hit by that car and you spent weeks and weeks in coma because we had an artist from China 
who was uh, who was hit and abused, and she went into a coma for three months. They had to keep her alive very, uh, you know, carefully. And when she woke up, she had a new gift that she had never had before. And she, the first words she spoke were, give me scissors. And she became, her name is Ku Shulan. She, be, she did these huge, like 18 foot complex paper cuts and uh, uh, with tissue paper that have now gone all over the world. She had very, very little. She would take uh, materially, she would take a uh, paper that was thrown away from stores and things and then stitch it together, paste it together with rice paper. And we also had another artist who was mugged brutally and ended up in a coma and became what's called a sudden savant. That's Jason Paget, And he woke up and he was never a good math student, but when he woke up, he could see in all everything he looked at, what are called fractal nature. And he became someone who could lecture on math and have so much, uh, he could draw a perfect circle freehand um, that he never had any of those gifts before he was between the worlds. So I was wondering, I mean, um, so when I heard that that was part of your experience, we've all, all of us at the American Visioning Art Museum just think you're a genius. We're lucky and blessed to have uh, been given works of yours that are in our permanent collection. We've shown you in several exhibitions. You touch hearts and minds for everybody who walks in. But I'm interested in your path, uh, intuitive path. And I think people in general who have had to be hypervigilant because your childhood was so extraordinarily brutal. To survive, you become, a, you read people, you read circumstances much faster than a regular person. And you've started that, I'm sure, very young to stay alive. So I just- I, I think- so. I, I, I think not, I try not to, Real on the violence that happened to me, but I do have to think about me getting hit by that car, drug up underneath the car, for half blocks, body all broken, in pain for three months, unconscious, and then when I did come out and and out. And, but because they had pulled the, ma the machine and said that I was brain dead. And if it hadn't been for my class coming in, making up the noises that they did, I probably wouldn't have had came conscious. My thing about those, uh, I'm a living example of give me a little more time. Give me just a little more time. I, I, hope and I advocate that we as humans, because I know that it takes a lot of money to run medical facilities and whatever, but I think that that human brain, it needs that time to finish healing that body. So my, I had been hit by a car and drug for two and a half blocks underneath that car. So the brain probably shot down for a specific reason that I wouldn't die. And that's throwing me in a conscious state of, of existing. But again, uh, just think about me being put, I, I'm down here in Montgomery now, but down the street, we get past that in a few minutes on the way back to Atlanta. There's a place called Alabama Industrial School for Negro children. It's in a place called Mount Meigs, Alabama. It's in a little bit in the county of Montgomery. But I never did think that I, I would have to affiliate with Montgomery as much as I am now in order to be able to bring the truth to everybody about what their brains can do. I, I don't want to see them having to go no prison I don't want to see them having to be shot. I don't want to see them having to be stun gunned. I don't see. I don't want to see them having to be. None of this stuff 
have to happen to them just for them to show somebody else. My brain is powerful, but the activities that my brain is going to cause my body to do, and that's another thing about me, is that I had so much to learn from. The drive-in theater was not even a half a block away from me in my backyard. George saw that. I was raised up from one and a half until I turned four. No, until I turned one and a half to yeah, four years old at the state fairground by a burlet dancer. So I was looking at fantastic things, uh, things that got blue ribbons. I, I I really always was interested in. I imagine I had that kind of brain to want the very best for this body. You got to understand what I was being involved with. George captured a lot of that. Why would I even go there? Why would I pick up somebody else's trash and tumble it around and mash it, squeeze it, paint it? and orchestrate it into something beautiful that it can have a state or take grandmamas and grandpaps oh what nobody else don't want and put them together and say this is a message this is what they are endured this is grandpa working at slaw furnace this is grandpa walking the ox in the wagon going to the mind to pick up the iron ore. It was stories and everything that I was touching. I did a piece, uh, The Goals of Creativity in Birmingham, Alabama during 1996 Olympic Games. I was doing things with these pieces of what they call debris. I was trying to bring some of the greatest stories that could ever be told about our Migration about our brain and our capability growth and all these other things. And George, not only George, but William Arnett, he was the guy that came into my life and said, this stuff needs to be preserved. It needs to be written about. It needs to be cataloged. It needs to be taken pictures of. We need to have stories of it. We need to have, and that was a little bit before we had the digital cameras that we have now. And and it just was so much, but it was just so much coming out of me at one time. It's raining outside. So it was like my brain was just pouring out information like raindrops. Yeah, no, that's incredible. And I guess kind of on that subject, um, I mean, we're so interested to hear about your experience. I mean, and maybe to elaborate more on just the journey that you all, both maybe you and Mr. King had in documenting um, and creating this this film that we all watched, um, which is one of the reasons, you know, why we all gathered here is we learned so much about your incredible story, but um, yeah, what was what was that experience like and, and, and filming that and documenting and yeah, carrying that story that you've now created and you can move forward with or, or share with the world, as you say, and continuing to expand and make sure that you leave that mark. Uh, for me, the uh, experience were another person to help with the teamwork mm -hmm. because it, it was team, it had to be a team effort in order for this to be as the song say, go and tell it over the mountain, over the hill and everywhere. See, it need to be told all around the planet. Mm -hmm. So in order for that to happen, it had to be written, it had to be photographed, it had to be videoed, it had to be put into, in, in, into movie form. We had to take and do the best that we could will they say use what you got until you get what you need so george actually had to use film 
and then he had to move that to another level of film. And then from that, he had to bring it through the digital to get it processed. And it was a whole lot that George had to do. I want to commend him for being with me these 21 or 22 years. I don't know exactly how many. George know more about how many. But I'm saying 20-something years of, of dealing with a man uh, and his family and, and everybody else that was in his circle of life, that's an awful lot of data uh, for a person. And, and, and he couldn't use it all. Just imagine if he could have made this uh, a volume film where you got volume one, volume two, volume three, or whatever. Uh, it's so much about uh, how much were uh, allowed to be offered to you all. Yeah, you know, it's um, the kind of work that I do involves meeting. It's an excuse really to knock on a lot of people's doors. And if they let you in, um, it's then a privilege to hear these stories that, frankly, a lot of Americans never hear. And um, it, it's an aspect of, um, of my life that I've just been in, in, amazingly grateful for that privilege to have knocked on a lot of doors, a lot, particularly across the American South and <laughs> recorded people. Uh, and Lonnie is, uh, is one example. Actually, I think it was, the film was 22 years in the making, but um, that, we we that we can attack another few years on to the end of that because uh, we're still uh, we're still uh, hanging out together and doing things from time to time. In fact, I found this thing the other day, Lonnie. I'm going to put it on the uh, film's website, or the no, maybe I'll put it on the Facebook page. Um, you interviewed me one time, and uh, it just cracked me up. I'd I'd forgotten all about it. I'd never did anything with it, and I just. Uh, and uh, the other day, I just sort of found this and, you know, clicked something and there it appeared. And uh, it's, I thought it was very entertaining. And of course, just as um, it's as much about you as it is about me, because you're asking these questions and chatting uh, uh, as well. So we'll put that on the Facebook page. Just uh, as Thank, a- Thanks, George. Thanks. We have a I was just saying thanks. Go ahead, Lonnie. No, I was just saying thanks to George, but you go ahead. Thank you. I just want to say that our museum has a big commitment to film documentaries about visionary artists. And I have to say there are a lot of poor ones out there, but we were privileged to be given from the Academy Award winning uh, filmmakers, Ali Light and Irving Seraf. They're sure five-part series. They gifted us um, the copyrights and the films. And so we, we have a high bar. And I have to tell you, it was um, absolutely a pleasure to see how respectfully you, you and with so much affection, that's very obvious, your, your film um, on Lani. And we just want to thank you for giving the people here tonight an advance uh, peek at such a life and for the, just the sensitivity that you, uh, that you brought to, and the love to, to capture what you could for all the rest of us uh, of Lani. It's, it's a story of friendship, isn't it too? Oh, definitely. Yes, it, yeah. yes, yes, yes. But the whole thing about what our examples are, I think that it's a two men's example uh, with what George has accomplished. But especially in this digital period is that everybody now can almost pick up their iPhones or cell phones and do some kind of video on it. Uh, those periods will be orchestrated, but also those periods will have a ways of going straight to the data cloud. So it's a different age that we're living in 
but by George being the type of example that he have been for other young uh, artists to continue uh, to work hard at whatever they are trying to accomplish. I think that's that's the main thing about both of us is that we want to see them accomplish. Yeah, you mentioned Allie Light. I knew Allie when I lived in San Francisco. Uh, an extraordinary person. I, I want to just say one thing and then I'm going to shut up, but um, we have an artist that we've worked with, a performance artist named Abu the Flute Maker here in Baltimore. And Abu always is kind of a griot. He tells his stories. Well, he makes musical instruments out of like the columns on front porches on small little things and pipes that have been thrown away. But what is similar, this, this uh, devotion to what is, is considered by many people throwaway, castaway garbage. He was a child who was thrown into a dumpster the moment he was born. And just somebody mm. passed by, heard a baby crying. And he always tells that story. I mean, even though he may not have a conscious memory of it. And I thought it was interesting that that sense of being kind of cast off as a child that he found so much meaning and beauty in making the most amazing music from things that perhaps people wouldn't even look at twice and think could make beautiful sounds. So uh, that was just a thought again. I see you, uh, Mr. Holly, in the context of visionaries throughout kind of time and place, you know, not just the American South. Uh, but I, I do think that Mr. Arnett did uh, an incredible service. And I think that you were a huge part in Souls Grown Deep, his master collection of inspiring him. He said he had never come to such a, an amazing um, single prof, uh, prolific art maker uh, environment in his life. I mean, you changed his life. And uh, I know he felt he was the better for it. I, I'm so glad that the amount that was preserved, I was almost about to come to tears because each time uh, the mentioning of William Arnett to me and knowing what he, he did, to get what he got done accomplished. It, it wasn't easy. It, it was not easy at all, especially with us, not just myself, because there are other artists that had contributed uh, to this whole world order. Uh, what I mean by whole world order, it was not just me that was in Alabama Industrial School for Negro Children. It was not just me that was being knocked out by some grown person's fist. It was not just me that had to come away from the city landfill with his grandmama early in the morning and then go to the graveyard and help her dig graves. My lessons of what I was taught, I did a song called, I Stole This Knowledge. But I also did another song called, They Beat the Curiosity Out of Me. I, I had this curiosity. I was curious from the day I was born, I believe. I'm the seventh of my mother's 27 children out of her 32 pregnancies. So you can imagine what kind of brain, if my mother had that kind of brain that she had to endure that many pregnancies, the, the thinking, the thinking uh, you're capable of, of so much, you can endure so much, but you have to do it with thought. I call it thought smithing. And that's what George saw. That's what William Arnett saw. They saw bits and pieces of all of this stuff I was putting together. 
I was putting it together sometime by the second. I was putting it together. I was going to the school, working with the school children, working with uh, el- uh, elderly people in the old folks' home. I was working with people that was considered to be disabled. I, I don't want to say that I was uh, a prophet, but I saw children in their wheelchairs turn their wheelchairs over just to get out of the chair and crawl and work on the material that I brought for them to work on. The story that the art would have told themselves if it hadn't all got buried. See, I didn't expose all those pieces that I had did in the front of those children. I brought them home, I boxed them up, and I packed them up, and I put them away. I put them away. So by the time the bulldozers got up and George got that in the film. Me, Bill got that in photograph. Everything, and this is the reason why I, I had an opportunity to tell myself, I had to say, self, okay, you got to render this. You got to turn it loose. You got to let it go. You understand what I'm saying? Because it's all right. You understand? It's all right. Sorry about that. I just get teared up sometimes. No, no need to apologize. Thank you. And I mean, yeah, it's we followed the documentary, followed your journey, and um, it was one with so many ups and downs. And so, you know, and yeah, how do you process that? And I felt like listening to your art was a way just to make sense and to, and to process and to somehow move forward. So. Um, no, no need to apologize. <laughs> yeah. um, but now the music is taking hold. I was just the music is taking hold now. Yeah. Yeah, it's taking hold. And I think the rest of the story is going to come out through the music. Because if you look at it in a biblical term and saying the pages of Harley, if you put me in the biblical terms of the pages of Harley and you listen at the, the music, I'm going to be like sometime like John the Baptist in the wilderness. I'm going to be like Jesus down by uh, the, the sea. I'm going to be uh, like Ezekiel and all these other prophets. They had to tell us about the materialistic facts that they was living with. And that's, that's the whole answer to what we are trying to figure out here. What is Lonnie Holly is all about? My life is about the materialistic facts that we are living with now. Uh, or else, uh, again, uh, else is there. Because if we can't care about the drains and things that allow the water to be drained, if we can't care about the roots that is growing in our the system that I used to crawl through, they call them sewer pipes. Mm-hmm. If we can't care about what the waste is doing, my grandmama taught me how to understand that waste at the city land field. If we can't care about that, we are in a big, big mess. I know, absolutely. And yeah, thinking about the documentary again, you left us off very much with those environmental issues and thoughts and considerations and questions in your art making. Um, is that something that you continue to work on and express in your music? How, yeah, what are you up to now? And from where the document left us, how has your music maybe grown? Can you bring us up to date, Lonnie? I think whatever, yeah. whatever I be up, I, th- I think, George, you can take on to that and bring, bring, them, bring them up to date, kind of let them know where I'm at. Well, I'll, I can tell you a little bit. Yeah, sure. I mean, first of all, you moved to Atlanta and uh, you've been working with Matt Arnett, um, Bill's son, one of Bill's sons, um, for the last dozen years, I'm guessing. Um, and you guys are touring the world. I mean, I'm always amazed by uh, your sort of insatiable 
travel schedule that just, uh, I mean, recently you've been in Mexico, you've been in the UK, uh, you've been in New Orleans. I mean, it's, uh, it's difficult to keep, hang on to your coattails. Um, and uh, so here's a question, Lonnie. What, um, what, what continues to inspire you today? Uh, living, George. Living is my inspiration. Uh, also, hoping that other people can appreciate living. Uh, I think the, the worst thing that can be happening for us right now is to know that we're living with wars still uh, occurring and rumors of wars and people is processing and angering to the point that they have to make wars. My thing, my thing is if we continue to collapse or tear down all that we have built, some people are not going to be able to build back, build it back. Uh, and then you got hurricanes and twisters and tornadoes that is coming through, and that's leaving a lot of people homeless. The thing that my works are still, I, I still have to carry the torch, even though I could have given it, I could have turned in the tower a long time ago, but you, you've been to where I live lately, and if you could have been in New Orleans this weekend and saw the, I, I, I was just, I was made so proud by the activities of collaborating with the other musicians in Music Box Village and all these other kind of things that we're doing with the art and music as a collaboration of two things, art and music, and then the museums that is taking uh, uh, control and saying, okay, directors are, uh, are reading the book that's necessary to, to read, not only uh, about my works, but others, others' works such as mine. We just, uh, uh, a few hours ago, left some of the younger ones, uh, some of the ones that is still able, is still at, have their thumbs on their finger and pushing those needles to get their cool thing done. The process of working uh, is still strong. And we are, are, as one would say, the foot shows that we left Joe Mental's house yesterday. It, it was raining real hard, but to see the work that Joe is doing, uh, tremendously powerful, uh, but also needing to be protected. Uh, I think I, I I can't do no more than say uh, we are doing what's necessary to be done, and that's continuing on. Yeah, I don't know if people know Joe Mint is uh, uh, an artist, um, old friend of Lonnie's, who lives in Birmingham, and uh, I'm. It's great to hear he's still working. Absolutely. If anyone has any questions in the audience, please feel, please feel free to type them in our chat. And we're monitoring those um, as we go through, through this program. Um, a question just came in. Tell us a bit about the connection between your art and your music. Um, how would you connect that for other people? Well, what I try to tell people, is, and I've told, uh, I've used this term uh, a lot of times, my art and my music is like Siamese twins. They're coming from the same place, coming from the same brain, coming from the same ocean of thought. Uh, the art has to be uh, picked up piece by piece and put together like a puzzle. 
and explained and given definition to it. And the music is being picked up piece by piece out of my brain, out of that that has occurred. And I put that together like a puzzle and then it's rendered and and then it's, it's being done. Uh, so I, I again, I'm proud enough to to know that this brain, even though I've went through so much, that is still is being is still doing what it's supposed to do. But you know, I'm, I'm 72 years old. My next birthday, I'll be 73. But again, I don't feel it. I feel like, you know, sometimes I feel it when I have to really, really get down and, and run or whatever. But otherwise, if I'm doing it with a slow pace, it's getting done. That's awesome. That's great to hear. Sometimes I feel <laughs> maybe weighed down. So um, I got to I gotta work on that. Maybe make some more art. Um, all righty. Another question that came in. Um, how did you and George meet? I think, I think, I, I think mm -hmm. it's not so much of, of working on that. Mm -hmm. I think that's just got to find its way of working out of you. You got to become submissive. We all have to become submissive to our craft. We can't be jealous of nobody else's uh, works. We can't be stuck in a category of, of letting material things get in our way because we're artists. We're artists. If material things is going to hinder us from doing our art, then you wasn't going to be an artist in a way. But if you see fit that you take the time, and it's really, really time now, uh, it's, the earth is requiring us to do more for her. I call it the mothership than any other time because not only the climate change, but with the rise of the water, the surfaces of the water is rising. So everything that's floatable all the way down to this tiny microscopic stuff that can float is going to get up and ride that water somewhere. Mm -hmm. A lot of people may not even not look at my environment to the depth that they need to look at it or look at Lonnie Holly's universe to the point that they need to try to understand from the little particles and what I sing about. I am a suspect. I'm in Montgomery, Alabama. I'm a suspect until I become a dustbag. When I'm dead and gone, I become a dustbag, but I'm gonna still be moving around in the atmosphere. I'm a part of this all, and we gotta realize that. If we can do that, and, and some of the students, I hope that there'll become more projects that would allow uh, people to get together and go and clean up the waterway. If we're gonna allow the water to rise, let's see, can it rise without our polluted uh, mess and all of these other stuff that we just can't leave that. Absolutely, yeah, I, I think about that a lot with um, future generations, um, my younger siblings, yeah, what are we leaving them and what, are, what, do, they have look, what do they have to look forward to? Um, so. Yeah, we have a lot to do. I heard you, I heard you mention um, how did we meet, and mm -hmm. uh, so to give Lonnie a little break here for a second, um, a sip of water perhaps. I'll uh, um, I'll tell you the story. So I I got interested in what I saw as this amazing outpouring of work, mainly coming from black artists in the South at the time. Um, compared to the contemporary painting that was coming out of New York and other places, it just seemed, you know, th there was so much passion and content in, in this work. So I was started interviewing people and talking to people, curators, gallerists, artists, et cetera, et cetera. 
and I'd heard about Lonnie, but I'd never met him. And um, so, you know, he was on the list. So I uh, called up and this young lady, young girl answered the phone. And I explained that I was, would like to visit and was that possible? And she says, just a minute. And I hear this sort of footsteps across the floor and this little voice and this sort of da -da 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 -da. And then she comes back and she says, okay. Uh, I said, oh, great. Well, thanks. Um, so we'll call you back when I'm, when I, and see if it's a good time. So I called that number about 73 times. Nobody ever answered it again. And I decided, let's just go. I mean, Lonnie had created this enormous several acres of art on this hillside near the airport. I thought, how could you miss that? You know, we'll just, we'll just go. So I got this friend who was a um, young black woman who's a, a, a camera person to come with me. And we set off and we, we got to Birmingham, started driving around. And we would ask people, you know, we're looking for this man who's got made all this art, et cetera, et cetera. Well, if you're a large white guy and you walk into the black community in most towns and start asking questions like this, people immediately are sort of uh, in kind of defense mode of where is he from? What does he want? This could only be bad news. So <laughs> nobody would tell us anything. And uh, we just, we, we couldn't find it. I mean, we drove around the airport everywhere, everywhere. And finally, I thought, well, well, just try calling one more time. And the little girl answered. <laughs> and I, said, I said, well, we're here. I mean, is it possible to visit? And so she says, just a minute. <laughs> tip, 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 tip. Yep, he says, come on. And I said, well, before we go any further, where, well, how do we get there? <laughs> and so uh, we finally got there, met Lonnie, and who is always a, a very gracious person. Um, and um, he basically spent the afternoon with us and made art, made, gave us stuff. Uh, it was a really amazing event. And I just said, at that moment, I realized, what's the point of having filmed all these other people? Because he actually is the kind of key to unlock all of this. And so I basically, we've never watched any of that footage, the other footage since and embarked on, you know, a 22 year project. So that's the story. Amazing, wow. Just a stroke of luck at the, the final call. <laughs> and, and the little girl I might add is now in her thirties and she's actually living with Lonnie in Atlanta, so. Oh, time flies. <laughs> yeah, Lonnie, what were your first impressions? What was that experience like, or was it <laughs> in meeting George? Well, I were used to giving information to William Marnett. I, I had a few people come with their cameras out and recording uh, certain bits and pieces, but they hadn't really came with the intention that George came with for this project. Uh, and I don't think George at that time, at the very first beginning, knew that that was what he's going to want to do. But I think after George got there and saw the massive uh, amount of art that had been created. Uh, the subject material, the, the, the difference in the materials are ranging from paintings to sculptures to all types of found objects. I had maybe two blocks of just materials that I found and dipped them into black paint and called it the black exhibit. I had so many things. Uh, I had been going up and down the creeks and the ditches uh, around the city 
and pulling out material from those creeks and ditches that had to do with our plastic habits, our environment, and the acid rain, these type of things that ordinarily people that was coming to look for art, they was not interested in probably none of that problematic stuff that I was doing because this, this, these was pieces that had to do with what the climate was going to be looking like. Style phones that had been burnt and all these other kinds of things. Everything that was happening in our factories and our companies or in our landfills, I had kind of duplicated it in my environment. Because you got to remember, I was trying to please my grandmother, my father's mother, because my father's mother were the one that had taught me, first of all, about how much stuff we were throwing away in the landfill. And when I got a chance to go to the city lot every day and see those big city dump trucks just open up and see so much come out of those dump trucks. And now it's even worse than one can imagine because we put it in plastic bag and seal those plastic bags up and think that we can get away with it. We almost made a balloon and then put it into the earth. And then at some point, and just because you don't have a bowl of cereal, if you have plastitized your trash and your garbage and then put it into these big bowls uh, and then pour in the liquid, which the liquid is going to leak in from our water flow, or from uh, our storms and the way that our creeks and ditches cut into surfaces of the earth and then at some at some point in 25 years from now or even maybe less than that our big landfills is going to going to find a way that this uh compressed material is going to burst out it's just going to burst out it's going to flow somewhere and sometimes those places is not going to be are visible to our site. So those were the type of things that George was interested in doing with me is Lonnie, uh, take me what you're talking about. Show me what you mean. Show me these ditches, show me these creeks. And I, 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 show me these landfills, show me these places. So if you look at the movie, uh, uh, again, the film, it, it's a, extraordinary, but it's a, it, it's it's a makeup, uh, and, and it's not all of it, because as George could say, I had to edit it out, and I, I, I had been did a piece with William Arnett, and it was just a roll of a film that they use in the drive-in, and it's called Don't Edit to the Wrong Thing Out, because if we're going to try to show the truth, we're going to need the truth, but there was not that much uh, monetary support for George, so he had to do what he possibly could in order to tell the nation or tell the world, uh, here it is. Here's our problem. Here's a young man. Uh, I ain't that much young no more. You can see my old grader, uh, but here's that old man now that is still pretty well saying the same thing that I said years ago. And that's what Matt, when, when Matt introduced me as a musician, he tell the people, Lonnie Holly is, is they don't, he dead on prank. He keeps saying the same thing over and over and over and over because that we haven't dealt with them factors. We haven't, we haven't dealt with them enough for me to be satisfied and say, okay, Matt, I can retire now because we don't hit the point. But, you know, reach our goal. I haven't reached my goal yet. Thank you, George. Yeah. And George, I mean, just 
you as as the producer, what was that process like in editing that out um, or, you know, selecting those items? What is that? Is well, it it's reminding me actually that there's a lot of material that we should try to put out on the Facebook page, on the website. Um, and uh, so I'm definitely committed to sort of launching some of that in the future. So if people should, um, if they're interested, tune into that. Uh, Lonnie just mentioned the black exhibit. And the black exhibit is one of the most amazing pieces of conceptual art <laughs> that I've ever seen. And Lonnie did it without, frankly, I suspect, knowing anything about conceptual art in any formal sense. Uh, but it's so sophisticated, it's so clever and so smart. And, um, and, he, and it's a story, basically. He tells a story and he has all these props that he's made. And so he tells this, this story of this young man and his, and his mother, um, which might even be autobiographical in some way. I don't know. Um, I think everything was about me and mama, George. I think everything was about me and mama. I had been separated from her so long and I had went through so much uh, hardship, had been mistreated along the way and almost killed uh, a few times there. And then when I did get to mama, uh, and I, I had a lot more to learn uh, before I became the artist that I am, an uh, awful lot more to learn. And I'm, I'm still learning as uh, we uh, go through our endeavors. I'm still learning, George. Sure. Somebody asked about the website. I'm going to try and type in the... Uh, um... Sure, yeah. And while we're doing that, we did get one more question um, from one of our attendees, um, Kalani. And after your experience with Birmingham Airport um, and kind of, I mean, the destruction of your art, what would you suggest or how should we, um, what did the question say? What should Birmingham do to preserve uh, Joe Minter's village? Um, and how do we go about preserving other art spaces? I think any space that finds out that these spaces is serving a universal purpose, they should pull their hearts out uh, to preserve those spaces. Joe's space is, is about our African experience. It's up on the hill uh, and my grandmother and my mother is buried in, in those cemeteries. And the cemetery is maybe a thousand uh, to two hundred thousand or more uh, black bodies are buried in those cemeteries. And then right up above that, he have this beautiful place that is is a tribute to all of those people that had rendered their lives did so much, not only the civil rights activities, but we can all look at all of the civil rights, uh, human walkers or marchers or foot soldiers or whoever, most of them are dead by now. Uh, John Lewis recently died. And before he died, I had an opportunity to run into him at the airport. I think I posted a picture of that. But John and I had been friends for a long time. He, had, he was a friend of William Arnett, just as Andy Young, Andrew Young, and Ambassador Andrew Young, that uh, had made a lot of the opportunities possible for Souls Grown Deep to be shown in the 1996 Olympic Games. These people that were the foot soldiers made so much happen for us to get where we are in our civil rights. Uh, the strugglers of today, the, I don't want to li like bring up, I, I don't want to say whose life matters more than 
whose life. I, I think all lives matter, but if we don't learn to appreciate the life that we have to make those lives matter and stop. Mama said, don't be stupid. Mama explained being stupid. If we're going to be stupid, if we're going to act like we can't get rid of hatred that's inbred within us, if we can't do what's just and right for each other to have this planet, how in the hell, excuse me, the first time you heard me curse tonight, but I'm a grown man. How in the hell will we get to the planet moon without an argument? How in the hell will we start a new camp on Mars? You understand what I'm saying? So if we can't do right on this earth, if we can't teach that we are in a digital age, digitalization, globalization, if we can't teach that we got to, first of all, be focused on making our brains the best example brains that ever lived. That's that, and I'm gonna say this, and then I'm gonna get off. Of, I ain't gonna get off because I'm gonna listen to what y'all gotta say. But I think my whole thing as a demonstrating artist, a lot of the kids right up the street in Birmingham, Alabama, they knew me as the Sandman. I demonstrated. I gave them the tools, and I gave them the material, and I told them to do their work. I wanted to see what they was going to do with their piece of sandstone. I wanted to see what they, they was going to do with their tools. And I also uh, I had met this director by the name of Dr. Richard Murray, and Dr. Richard Arrington was our first black mayor of the city, we got together and I say, Do, uh, Dr. Arrington and Dr. Mary, uh, I would like to go out there and I would like to challenge children and see can I get them to not be so abusive towards each other and see, I wanted to create something that will make them think, make them think make them come away from there without their blades or without their guns or without retaliation to every little bit of uh, a conversation that made them angry. We need to let them know you got to be able to endure certain bits of information if you are going to be the best. Dr. King said, be the best at what you do. Be the best. Mm -hmm. And that's all I tried to do, it to be the best. Absolutely an incredible goal. Um, and for everyone to to reach for and to strive for, um, especially in an environment that we're living in today, um, where sometimes that hatred can be very overwhelming, um, even on a day-to-day -day basis. So thank you. Um, it's scary though. It's scary, it's, it's very scary. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And um even reflecting on the past two years of that we've all experienced and then trying to come out and process. And um, I don't know if that had any impact on, on your art making or, or music making process um, living through the pandemic. The pandemic for my work were seeing the Pope people sir, su suffer even more because they was getting Four and and four. Something stopped. Mm -hmm. That means the job was cut off. Mm -hmm. The little money that the people were making had to be allocated. Uh, somebody had to be put together uh, and thought about before the stimulus. It was a while before those stimulus checks came out. And the little bit amount of stimulus that they got was not enough to sufficiently support them for a certain amount of time. The water bills uh, climbed extremely high. The light bills climbed extremely high. Everything was changing, but the wages. The wages wasn't changing at all. Everything was at a standstill. 
for most of those people, I don't want to say how a lot of those people feel, but if anybody could understand stress, stress leads to tension. Tension leads to illness. Illness leads to death. This is all I have to say. I, I, I don't know, do a person to kill with a weapon or kill me by taking my spoon from me. I think William Arnett, the young William I met on that, we were looking at a piece the other day and Matt say, we need to take and have this uh, piece, maybe even bronze to make it as large as we can. It's called spoon and chains. You don't have to put me in chains. You don't have to shackle my legs uh, or my feet. All you got to do is put my spoons in chains. Don't allow me to get proper food. Proper food is not just saying, okay, I'm going to give you enough money to go to Burger King. I'm going to give you enough money to go get a pizza. We need to teach nutrition and their values. We need, if you're going to, I think I did uh, a, a piece, uh, Fifth Child Burning, where Fifth Child Burning mentioned all kinds of little things that was going to be necessary to make our world not catch on fire. Absolutely. And I mean, food and good nutrition are the foundations, right, of our developing brains or our bodies, right? And something that, um, yeah, we need to cherish. And if we don't have those, those elements, where does that leave us? So I absolutely agree. Um, it's weak mind, weak, weak minds and bodies make uh, weak living conditions. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Lani, you know, we see this uh, campaign that they used that even though he was a physician, the head of Syria did uh, starve or kneel to the villages that weren't pro his, his presidency and um, to the point where he, real, uh, he realized if, if, there was no, if he could cut off the water and cut off the, the food, and that's being practiced right now uh, you know, in Ukraine. It's a terrible uh, tactic, but when when you speak, I'm so happy to hear the depth of your acute awareness of of the earth that started with your grandmother. We devoted two years to the largest art science exhibition uh, called "The Secret Life of Earth" on all the pollution, and you gave a beautiful explanation tonight of when you have. Uh, when you keep condensing the, um, the landfills with all the plastic bags, all the different things, all of that begins as it breaks down to leach into groundwater. And so there's all this other thing that, that travels that, that poison uh, out in larger amounts, et cetera. We also did a year long exhibition on food and food scarcity. Uh, so you could have come and curated anything with us. And I just thank you for having um, so much, for someone who has gone through so much personally, you have transcended so much to think of everyone on the largest sense of, of the planet, of well being of people. And um, I really thank uh, Mr. George King for uh, doing something that is so important, the what you have done with documenting the, the film and the life, because sometimes things get thrown away as you were saying, and yet the film will also endure to see the work, to see what you meant from your own words. When Grandma Prisby's uh, Bottle Village was made, and at 15, she was this pretty little girl to desperately poor parents, and a 52 year old salesman came by and her parents uh, uh, married her off to him and they got a new room. And she said, I was sold, don't you think? But she kept her spirit the whole time. And as an old woman, she built 15 houses out of glass bottles at the dump, mm. installing the electricity, pouring <laughs> the concrete, everything herself. 
and uh, singing these bawdy songs when people would visit. And uh, an earthquake took them down a lot after being up for 20 years. And the federal government actually gave a grant to repair them. And a business person said, that was just junk. We won't, even though it would have given uh, employment to people in his district to help re reconstruct her bottle village, he said, no. And so it's very interesting, you know, the people who discount the work and if it was not for the Alley Light Irving Seraf film uh, on Bottle Village, which I can't recommend enough, um, there would be nothing to tell her, in her words, her story, and to see her Bottle Village at, at the best. But again, she saw beauty in what is discarded. And uh, that is something that in our next exhibition is gonna be called by, it will be curated by one of our young curators, Gage Branda. It's gonna be called Abundance, too much, too little, just right. I, I think uh, what you just said about uh, people ridiculing or uh, criticizing, I think most of those people wanna be where we are but they cannot be where we are because they was not chosen to be there. I don't think no artist should be stopped by anybody else's criticism. When they feel what they're doing is just and right. Another term of Dr. King were, if I didn't get off my horse to help to this, this man, what would happen to this man? If I didn't do what I do to help this planet, what will happen to this planet? And that's the way I feel about my art. And I think I think all the other artists, such as Thornton Dow, I met pretty well all the artists that was in Souls Grown Deep. <clears throat> but the more outstanding ones were Certain Dow, Joe Mentor, as far as materials, understanding what had happened from slavery up until now with the materials that we had to use. And those little bit bits and pieces that was thrown to us, we was always given the less, not the best, the less. I did a song uh, while I was in New Orleans. Everything is the masterpieces. Everything that we had created from slavery up until now, somebody sitting back thinking that they are the masters over it. It belongs to them. And, and they have these little puppets out there that consider themselves as criticizers. And a lot of the criticizers just be trying to get their page, get the page, get enough pages in the book uh, to get that book full. And th uh, thank you. I, I don't know whether y'all don't heard me enough, but I gave it back to, I yield the flow and give it back to George. Yeah, I actually think um, we should probably respect the fact that uh, Lonnie is uh, no longer 20 years old and he's in a van somewhere in Montgomery. Um, so maybe, I mean, if there is one more question, but I think we should think about. Uh, yeah, yeah, I was getting ready for him well. get a break. Yeah, well, I guess one quick question, Lonnie, health wise, how are you doing? I know that you mentioned earlier that you feel good or um, some days are, you know, maybe not so good, but overall, how are you feeling? Because I know- uh, I, I, I feel, uh, I, I'm not Jane Brown, but I feel good. <laughs> <laughs> like I know that I would, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I wasn't trying to be funny, but again, I'm sitting in front of the Montgomery slave trade is on a spine. 
it showed you, it tell you how the slave trade and how many slaves was traded in Montgomery. But that was just Montgomery. That was not throughout Alabama. The story of slave trade throughout Alabama, the different rivers and everything, uh, a lot of people say, you got a little slave in your family? They may not even know, you know what I'm saying? Uh, they may not know. So if I am a part of that kind of recent or Lonnie come lately to explain himself as a human. And I'm living in the state of Georgia now, but I'm almost through Alabama as often as I've ever been before. Yeah, well, amazing. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for your time. We're getting thank yous and our comments. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been a gift and it has been to um, talk with you to hear about your journey and um, yeah, Mr. King as well, and your inspiration in the documentary. And so um, for those who are joining us in the chat, remember that um, Lonnie Holly, you can reach his story and information about him at www.lonniehollystory.com. Um, we'll be sure to post that and share that with folks after this um, session. But yes, Rebecca. Yeah. Uh, I see from our Melissa Morrow, our own Melissa, who's worked for so many years at the museum and is a big fan of yours. She was asking whether you would favor us at the very end with just some, a little bit of song that comes through you. Yes, uh, I sure will. We must carry on we must learn to be strong we will have to encounter all sorts of weather but in the end, in the end, if we're strong enough, we will win. We will win. Hand and hand and hand, oh, we'll turn into the trillions of hands working together out of the millions of humans that's on the planet that we call our mothership. We all we gotta do is learn how to keep focus, how to keep safe, how to help each other as we use this here mother. Thumbs up for Mother Universe humans. And thank you all so very, very much. Thank you all very much for letting me do that little piece of song. Yes. Thank you, thank you. Sorry, what? I didn't mean to make y'all cry there. No. I, 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 I just. So much, it was beautiful. Um, I don't know how one of those in a more perfect way to end this session. Thank you again so much to you both for your time. Um, we wish you all happiness, good health, um, a, a, hopefully a brighter few, a brighter, brighter year, and um, hopefully we'll keep in touch. Everybody, thank you so much for joining this program, um, and we'll be sure to see you all in the next one. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Looking forward. Looking forward. Thank you, Joy. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Lonnie. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. Yep. Thumbs up. <laughs>